Well, good morning and welcome to Church Without Religion. My name's Andrew Farley. I'm the pastor here. I'm currently doing a conference in Tyler, Texas. And then after those three days of conference, uh, hopping a plane to uh, just off the coast of South America for a short mission trip of several days, sharing with different uh, groups there. So please pray for me and my travels, and in particular, my health as I go down there and spend uh, 10 days really on travel. So uh, with that, why don't we go ahead and open with a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this morning. We just ask for your spirit to be our our counselor and our guide and our comfort and to show us the truth that will set us free as we spotlight the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Spotlight Resurrection. The title of this message is a perfect fit for what we looked at last week when we saw the cross-eyed concept, putting the cross in focus, looking at the meaning of the death of Jesus Christ. Well, today we're going to highlight the life of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about what the resurrection means to us personally But before we get into asking, what does it mean to you personally, let's see what it meant to the Apostle Paul. Here are his curious words. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Now, for many of us and for myself for many years, I mean, perhaps these words have meant very little to you. It makes for a great Bible verse, but in practical terms, what is this all about? First, God's grace is enough. Second, there's a power that comes with God's grace. And that's what Paul is talking about here. And perhaps this is one of the most neglected aspects of the grace message, that God's grace comes with power. That there is the power of the resurrected Christ dwelling within us, and that is by grace. So grace is not merely mercy, Grace is not merely God picking us up when we fail. Grace is not a band-aid alone, a band-aid for our wounds. But grace is the power of the gospel in the midst of our weakness. It is the power of God's grace and the power of Christ's resurrection life that lifts us up to a place of new understanding, a place of new attitudes, a place of new perspectives on what's happening to us. You know, last week I talked about how we have struggles and temptation. Uh, A large percentage, over half of men at some point struggle with pornography. Where is the answer in that weakness? Uh, Women struggle with all kinds of things as well. In fact, it's just under 50%, I believe, that of women that struggle with lust and pornography. So it's not merely a male struggle. And then you look at the struggles in our relationships with our spouse and how we relate to our children. Uh, We look at the outbursts of anger that we as fathers are so tempted to go to in desperate times. We look at the failure to listen to our spouse and to respond quickly with a knee-jerk reaction, assuming the worst about another person's motives instead of assuming the best. Where is the power for change in these everyday problems? Does being a Christian really matter? Is it just about forgiveness and heaven? Or are there real practical answers right here, right now, for the struggles of today? Well, looking at this passage from the Apostle Paul, 
he seems to believe that on his worst day, in the midst of his weakness, being emotionally weak, uh, being intellectually weak, being physically weak, in the midst of his worst day and his weakest day of all, he sees that that is actually a time to come to an understanding, to, to reach a new place of understanding where it's not about me, it's not about my resources, it's not about my abilities, it's not about my coping mechanisms, it is about the power of another who lives within me who will express himself and mold and shape my attitudes and truly be my helper and my counselor and my comforter and my life. And how does it come to us? It comes to us at salvation, but it comes to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's why we're looking at this complement to the cross the meaning of the resurrection, spotlighting it today. And in order to understand the resurrection, I guess we need to understand our problem and our need for resurrection life. We were dead and we were in need of life. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. The unbelieving world seems to think that we believe that their problem is their behavior. And so the average reaction to Christian thought is, well, I'm a really good person. Or, well, I, you know, I do good things for other people. I'm charitable. I'm nice. Uh, you know, if you were to grade me, I'd get a good score overall. And they believe that we're sitting around thinking that their behavior is the issue. And what the Bible really reveals to us is that the core issue is not behavior. Those are just symptoms. And you can have bad-looking behavior or good-looking behavior and yet still be spiritually dead. And so Ephesians 2 reveals the genuine problem we were dead in our sins. So you actually see two issues there. We're dead and we've got the wrong location. We're dead and we're in sins instead of being in Christ. So we need two answers. We need to be placed in Christ. And in so doing, we need to be made alive, no longer dead. Romans chapter 5 says it another way. Therefore, sin entered the world... Through one man, that's Adam, and death came through sin. Don't miss the death issue. We can try to reform this country. We can say, go USA. We can try to reform the behavior of American citizens. We can try to reform the behavior of Canadians. We can try to reform the behavior of people around the world. But don't miss Romans 5.12. It is not merely a behavior issue. What does it say? Death through sin. Death is the problem. Death came to all men because all sinned. Now you say, how in the world did all sin? I mean, back in the garden, nobody else was even born yet. Well, we see this interesting concept in Scripture, and it's threaded throughout. The idea of being in Christ is not reserved to Christ alone. There is also a concept of being in Adam. And so because we are born naturally in Adam, in a sense, we were in the loins of Adam when he sinned. And therefore, sin was passed down, and therefore, death was passed down, because our lineage sinned. Our heritage sinned. Our lifeline, or better yet, death line, sinned. And so, much like we see uh, these, uh, um, these lineages, these heritages described, these genealogies in the Bible, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so. That's all very interesting, 
and it helps us understand Jesus and his lineage, his physicality. But it's also just a reminder that there's a spiritual parallel to all of that. And the bottom line of what Romans 5 is saying is that death begat death, and death begat death, and death begat death. And then one day, you show up in the line of death. And what is your need? Not behavior reform. Your need is divine life. You think of a person who's on the side of the road and they're dead, perhaps from a heart attack. Well, they don't need a lecture. They don't need to be propped up uh, and told to move better and act better and think better. None of that is their solution. They need life. They're dead. They need the EMT. They need the paddles. They need those electric shock paddles put down on their chest so that they can experience the miracle of resurrection coming to life again. And that's what we need spiritually. So when Jesus offers us salvation, he is not offering us a manual for spirituality. He is not offering us a manual and a new home someday. It is more than all of that. He comes in like the EMT. He comes in with the paddles ready to shock us into new life. And when he infuses us with himself, that is exactly what we get. We are resurrected from the inside out. Colossians 2 again affirms the same issue when you were dead in your, in your sins. Again, the problem is death, and the problem is your location. You are in your sins. You are in this uncircumcision of your flesh. God did what? He made you alive with Christ. You became alive. You got a new location with Christ, and He forgave us all our sins. Wow, if you were looking for one of the best verses in the Bible to encapsulate the whole message of the gospel, this is a pretty good candidate. You were dead. You were in the flesh. God made you alive. He put you with Christ, and He forgave you all your sins. Does it get any better? And so, again, we see the problem and the solution right before our eyes. So what is it that people try to do to get life? You know, we look to so many things to try to get life, and perhaps one of the most tantalizing temptations of all is to look to religion, to look to rules and laws and a cleanup program to try to get life. We imagine that we can almost, it's as if we're going to grab a hold of those tablets that Moses brought down Mount Sinai, and we're going to hug them, and we're going to hold them, and we're going to cherish them, and we're going to write on our hands and write on our forehead so that we can think them and act them, and we're going to do them. And then what happens? We are so far from our goal by the end of it all. Today I received an email. Someone was forwarding an email from a, a ministry, I won't name the ministry, but they had the New Year's resolution that you should make. They had it listed out for you. And I didn't know what this person thought of this list, but he forwarded it to me with nearly no comment at all and said, here you go, Andrew. And I read through it, and by the time I got to the fourth or fifth item on the list, I was exhausted I mean, it was all about having to read this frequently and study this much and invite this much and share this much and do this much. And it was 10 new commandments, essentially, for modern-day Americans to adopt as their New Year's resolution this year. God forbid we make our best attempt at this one, and then perhaps there'll be a new list in January of 2020. But you see... We humans, we tend to believe that we can look to a list, look to a series of rules or laws. We can look to a, 
an improvement program take hold of that and that somehow God will bless that. God will bless your efforts, we say. God will bless your rule keeping. God will bless your law keeping. And you know what the New Testament tells us? The law is not of faith. What? Yeah, Galatians says the law is not of faith. It takes no faith at all to obey a bunch of laws. Even if you could pull off some or most of it, not all of it because nobody can obey the law, but obeying the law in your own effort, well, it takes no faith at all. The law spurs human effort. It excites the flesh, but the law could not make us alive. Galatians 3 Paul says it this way, is the law opposed to the promises of God? Of course not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. Now, two beautiful thoughts here in this passage. First of all, you notice it was very common for Jews to think that the law would bring them life. That's what we see in Romans 7. The very commandment that I thought would bring me life brought me death. The commandment came in and I died. The commandment killed me or showed me my death. But I thought it was going to bring me life. I thought religion was the answer. I thought thought obedience was the way. If I obey, I'll become alive. And if we're not careful, many Christians think that even after being saved. They think if I obey... God will make me more righteous. If I obey, God will make me more holy. If I obey, God will make me closer to Him. If I love Him more, He will love me more. What do we see here? We see that the law and the promises of God are totally apart from each other because the law was never intended to bring life. You don't get close to God through the law. You don't get right with God through the law. You don't get forgiven by God through the law. All of that was shadows and symbols and pictures of Jesus. And the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. So the law is a shadow. The reality is Christ. We do not mix Christ with a shadow. We do not mix the reality with a symbol. And so we see another little nugget here that I just want to have you take note of. It's beautiful. Life and righteousness are synonyms in this verse. Look at it. If a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. What does this tell you? Righteousness, the kind we have, the kind of righteousness that we possess involves life. It's not a bookkeeping righteousness. It's not a symbolic or lifeless righteousness. It's not a righteousness kept in heaven for us somewhere in a categorical bin of positional truth. No, the righteousness that we have comes from being made alive. The righteousness that we have is a reborn righteousness. It is a righteousness of the Spirit. It is imparted. It is shared. It comes through new birth. It comes through new life. Our righteousness is real. And our righteousness is now. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death, Paul says in Romans 7. And you know the Romans 7 story. It's struggle after struggle. He fought the law and the law won. There is no life in the law. The law is not of faith. So Jesus came to give us life. And many people miss that. They think of Jesus as a good teacher with some good principles and some good ideas and that he just wants us to be nice and be loving and have a soft heart and just care for people. But there's something deeper. He's saying your heart is no good apart from him. Apart from him, you can love no one. Apart from him, you can do nothing. And you must be killed. And then you must be resurrected. I know I said it in such a direct manner that it's almost offensive to us. It's not politically correct, but 
We must be killed. We must be taken to the cross. We must be crucified. The old self must be snuffed out, annihilated, so that we are joined with Christ as a new creation, a new self, no longer the old, but all things have become new at the core of our being where Christ dwells. Christ came to give us life. John 5 says this, Jesus is speaking. He says, you, the Jewish community around him, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So you'll notice we said earlier there, humanity, we all, we look to law. We look to religion. And here they're looking to a book. As awesome as the scriptures are, and here it would be the Old Testament scriptures, as incredible as they are, as divine as they are, as inspired as they are, as perfect as they are, they are never a substitute for possessing the divine life of Christ in you. Without Christ in you, the Bible alone is just a book. It is Christ in you that shows you the truth of the Bible and the author of the Bible. When the author possesses you and you possess the author, it makes all the difference, doesn't it? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I want you to notice this little phrase, have it to the full. Shouldn't Christians be having the most fun of all? I'm not talking about earthly circumstances. I mean, as Paul told us, he experienced weakness. As we see in the book of Acts and, and in the early church history that we have, we see all kinds of trouble and tribulation and trial. You look at the underground church in a place like China over the years, over the centuries, the persecution. You look today in the Middle East, there's persecution today of believers. I'm not talking about the circumstances out here, but I'm talking about the joy in here. I'm talking about the contentment and the fulfillment, life to the full. When we really get it, we understand that we've got the answer. I don't mean that we always feel good. I don't mean that we always think right. But when it comes down to it, on your worst day, driving down the road, tears streaming down your cheeks, trying to figure it out, he'll whisper to you. He'll, he'll wink at you. He'll hold you in his arms. He'll remind you of who you are and who he is to you. He'll never leave you. He'll never stop comforting you. He'll always be counseling you. He'll never abandon you. Life to the fullest is life with a constant presence, Jesus himself. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. You see, it's all about life. It's not about behavior. Behavior comes from life, but life must come first. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. John 5 says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. It makes you picture a big chasm. Here's a cliff on one side and a cliff on the other and a big chasm in the middle. And God swoops down and rescues us, transferring us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Like a crane operator, like a master crane operator hoisting us out of Adam and placing us in Jesus Christ. The life that we have in Jesus is eternal. It never ends. 
Romans chapter 6 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us never forget the meaning of this word eternal. Eternal is not just life with no end. Eternal is actually life with no end and life with no beginning. Now, who is the only one with no beginning? Whose life is the only life that has no beginning and no end? Well, of course, that is Jesus' life. And so when you are given Jesus' life, that is an eternal life. And when we speak of being given eternal life, we need to know that that is actually receiving the life of Christ, being infused with the resurrection life of Jesus. How incredible is that? Real Christianity is Him giving His life for us and then depositing His life in us. Hebrews chapter 13, it says, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You know, people abandon us. They leave us. They forsake us. They love us in conditional ways. Uh, Whether it's a marriage that has fallen apart, friendships that break up, dating relationships, people get ticked off when we don't perform in the ways that they would hope for according to the standards that they set up for us. This is human to human stuff and it happens all the time. But God doesn't play that game. All expectations were met. The law was fulfilled. We don't owe God. We could never pay Him back anyway. And for that reason, He has set it up He has set it up so that we enjoy a perfect and permanent connection with Him no matter what. Never will I leave you. It's amazing to me. I've been a pastor for some time now and I take questions on radio and counsel people one-on-one. And there's a common thread. And the common thread of many questions that we receive is, did I mess it up? Can I mess it up? Did I ruin it? Am I out? Is God done with me? Is it over? And we keep asking, did I, can I, have I? And his answer every single time is the same. Never, never will I leave you. Do we believe him or are we going to call him a liar? We are actually saved by Christ's life, not merely by his death. Many think we're saved by the cross of Christ. We talked about the meaning of the cross last week. So important, so central, the powerful message of the cross. There's nothing like it, but don't stop there. Don't stop at the cross because we are actually saved by Christ's life, by his resurrection. Romans 5 puts it this way, if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son... How much more, having been reconciled by the death, shall we be saved by what? What is it that saves us? We're saved by his life. If the resurrection did not happen, if only the cross of Christ were applied to you, then you would be a spiritual corpse. You would have your old self dead in Christ, buried in Christ, And you would be no one. You would be a nobody. If only the cross were applied to your spirituality, if only the work of the cross were applied to your situation, you would be no one at all. People don't understand that. But your old self is dead. You've got no new self. So who would you be? You'd be nobody. You'd you'd have a soul and a body. Perhaps you'd be crawling around like an animal of the forest. Animals have souls and bodies, but no spirit. People say, can I lose my salvation? I say, if you lost your salvation, spiritually, you'd be nobody. You can't go back to your old self. Your old self is dead, buried, and gone. 
If you lost your new self and couldn't go back to your old self, you'd probably be crawling around on the ground like an animal or completely unconscious. Who knows? But it can't happen. You can't reverse new birth. We're saved by His life. And that's an eternal life. So you will be saved as long as Jesus lives. And that's forever. Because He lives forever, He is able to save you completely. John 14 says it another way, the same truth, the same power. Here it is. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Why are you going to live? Because he lives. Do you live because you live so great? Do you live because you act so good? Do you live because you're so obedient? Do you live because you're so consistent? No, we live because He lives. Do you see it? The length of your salvation is tied up in the length of Jesus' life. Your security is tied up in His divinity. The length of your salvation is permanently connected to the length of His eternal life. That's why you will be saved forever. Ephesians 2 says this, Because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Do you see the synonym? Do you see the parallel? He says you've been made alive, and then he says you've been saved. Those are the same things. To be made alive is to be saved. To be saved is to be made alive. It is not merely forgiveness. It is divine life poured out into our hearts by the Spirit of Christ Jesus living in us. Christ in us, our only hope of glory. Christ is our life. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. The life is a person. Eternal life is not a gift package. Eternal life is not a book. Eternal life is not a building for an hour a week. Eternal life is not a ticket to heaven. Eternal life is a person. Jesus said, I am the life. John 11, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me, shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus is the life. Philippians 1, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Do you see Paul's attitude here? He is not merely a follower of Christ. He is not merely a disciple of Christ. He is saying that to live is, is Jesus. Any sense of purpose, any sense of meaning, any sense of fulfillment, he has identified. It is Jesus in me, Jesus through me. Perhaps Paul many times uttered something like this. I know that I could chase after this. I know that I could pursue this. I know that I'm smart enough to gain this. I know that I could quit any time and go after this. But let me tell you, there's nothing better than knowing Jesus Christ. To know the power of His resurrection. To know His presence in me. To be able to express the, the fruit of the Spirit. God has the market cornered on all fulfillment. And when God, when God himself takes up residence inside of me, are you kidding? Work out your salvation because God has worked it in. So work it out because there is no better life. Life is all about knowing Jesus. We'll finish with this. Look at Paul's attitude. It's similar to what I just expressed informally, but here we see a formal expression of it. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing 
greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, dung, garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Paul lost a lot of things. He was an intelligent man. He was a capable man. He was a leader. He was respected by his peers. He could have carved out any successful life for himself that he wanted. And in fact, he thought he was. He was on a road pursuing the snuffing out of God's people, the persecution of Christians, the massacre of the church, all in the name of serving God, he thought. And he was fully dedicated and fully committed, and people knew him. They knew him as the warrior for God. They knew him as Yahweh's right-hand man. They knew him as blameless. According to the law, his friends saw him blameless. They didn't see that coveting issue inside, they thought he was a spotless embodiment of all that the law requires. Imagine having all that going for you and then realizing you're absolutely dead wrong and that Jesus is Messiah and that he has resurrected from the dead and everything that you've built for yourself is nothing. It is dung. It is garbage. It is rubbish. And the best thing going for you now is just to admit it, to suck it up, admit it, and get to know this Jesus. Well, I don't know your situation. Maybe you think you've carved out quite a life for yourself and you've found some meaning and purpose. Or maybe you've hit rock bottom. Maybe you never have been that successful in this life. Well... The good news here is that the message is the same for all of us. If we have successful, strong-looking flesh, or if we have weak, failing flesh in this world, either way, that's not the answer. The answer is not try harder or give up, take a break and try later. The answer is a third way altogether, and His name is Jesus. The good news is he's not far off. He's close. He's with you. He's right next to you. He's in you. He goes before you. He's behind you. He's beneath you. He's on every side of you. You are enveloped in him and he is life to you. There is no life outside of him. You will never find life to the full outside of Jesus. So with his presence in you, why not allow he who began a good work in you to proceed with the completion of that work and just let him do what he's designed to do just as you received him, so walk in him. Walking in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ who dwells within you. That, my friend is the reason for which he was raised. He was raised for you to give you life, to express that life in you as you trust him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. We believe it. We affirm it. We recognize it had a purpose. The resurrection of Christ was for us. And Father, We agree with you that there is no life apart from Christ. There is no fulfillment apart from you. And we thank you for the resurrection power of Jesus living in us. And when the practical issues of everyday living hit us, Father, remind us of the resurrection. The resurrection response to lust. The resurrection response to when anger hits and there's hurt and pain and abandonment, the resurrection life of Jesus in the midst of marriage, the resurrection life of Jesus in our personalities in the midst of struggle. Father, remind us of what it means to be indwelt, 
infused with the life of your spirit forever. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.